different uh, you know things that is going to involve a whole I would say data timeline from like collecting data all the way to you know, visualize it. And so, yeah, this is me, uh, father, husband, uh, basically just all I do, just literally implement what smarter people do like him and Wolverine and other people, right? So contribute to a few projects, open source projects, uh, and I'd like to uh, thank my wife for supporting me over the last here, traveling 15 states and a few countries, so <laughs> gotta give her a shout out. Yeah. Yep. All right, if I ever worked for Rodriguez, I work for uh, Spectrox. Uh, I'm the author of a couple of projects in GitHub, uh, for example, 300 playbook, the Hunting Elk, and also the Invoke Attack API, which you know, moves data from minor attack framework, the whole database, and start giving you in a more meaningful uh, you know, way. And I'm a former senior threat hunter for Capital One, where actually I started doing a lot of development of their hunting engagements and things like that. So what we're bringing today is a combination of you know, Nate's uh, experience and also my experience of developing things for hunting and things like that. Today we're going to be talking about, uh, first, just to a little bit about the state of where I've seen, for example, organizations are from a collection, transformation, storing, and also visualization perspective data. Um, after that, we're going to talk about a little bit of the collection, what are the needs, uh, you know, things that you need to collect, and how you need to collect the transformation of the data as well. And then at the end, we're going to show you a little bit of the benefits of actually doing it right, and how it affects all the way. Like, it's not just a matter of pushing your data all the way to a database and they just expect to be awesome and do a lot of you know cool stuff. So we're going to show you a couple of the benefits of all that. So once again, um, so you know. This problem is I like to just separate it in three categories. And that's because I think it's easier just to focus on little pieces at a time. And the first one, um, I've seen a lot of organizations now doing their at least right from a collection perspective. And now they have the right, um, I would say, probably attitude and the right also expertise where now they're enabling, for example, PowerShell logging and things like that. They're moving now to into like using some type of like OS query or Sysmon and pulling all that data. Um, Something that I think that there is still a little bit of you know, confusion is actually the specific techniques that you can do to collect that data. And there is actually a paper by uh, Jerry Atkinson, actually, that you can have the link in there. Um, but basically talks about three different ways to pull data or the data available in your environment as well. So the first way is point in time. So it's something that you will need some type of like scripting capability. And I want to show you how that actually you know, happens. Historical time is just your Windows event logs. It's something that you have, you know, right out of the box. And in real time is something that you need to add, like an agent, you know, monitoring for new things such as Sysmon or EDR and things like that. And of course, the challenges right now that I'm seeing a lot are actually what else do I need to collect and how do I actually prioritize what to collect in my environment. And of course, the other challenges are like, you know, it would be awesome if you have only Sysmon, let's say, or you know, always query pooling data. You have a lot of stuff actually running in your environment. And I'm actually amazed every time you know, I go to, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to a client, the different type of tools that they have, that some of them do the same thing. And of course, you have your EDR solutions on the top of it to the rescue, right? So when you kind of like collect all the data, you're actually creating this a lot of noise. And that's what the talk was like, you know, the quieter uh, you become, the more you can hear, actually. If we move to the transformation piece, I guess that is also a little bit of confusing between where you need to transform, filter, massage your data, and depending on what technology you have, for example, you might do it in real time, so you might have a pipeline before it hits your database, or you wait until your data gets to your database and then do transformation at query time. Very important to remember that because that would also define how you set up your environment and things like that. 
you know, of course, the challenge isn't there. A lot is, you know, there are different data sources with different formats, different data fields that give you the right, uh, you know, same value, and vice versa. So it gets a little weird, and of course, that's gonna um, uh, that's gonna affect a lot of your, you know, procedures such as your, you know, hunting engagements, your incident response operations, and things like that, because you will have to go to different uh, dashboards with different data sources. So it affects all the stuff, and I'm seeing that a lot. And of course, from a story and a visualization perspective, I think that one of the biggest challenges is, you know, big data. Now everybody's throwing everything to their databases. Now you have to know what you need to collect and things like that. So a lot of companies are moving from great technologies just because of the amount of data that they have. And of course, if you're going to start doing visualizations, the more distant your data is, you're going to be showing a lot of stuff and having, for example, your analysts going to different tools just to pull different, you know, data sets and things like that. So if this is happening in your environment, believe me, it happens you know, in you know, Fortune 10 companies, Fortune 50 companies, they're actually doing it just, you know, just like that. So just to let you know, like, that's pretty much what's, you know, what's happening. So today we're going to be talking a little bit of what I've talked to some people and they say, man, it's boring to do transformation of data and you know, talk about like, documentation of all this metadata, every single field that I have in my environment. I like to do the cool stuff. I like to just to grab the dashboard, do some queries, some joins with this great technology and just find evil. Well, in order to be here, you have to be talking about the cool and the, a little bit of the cool stuff and the so boring um, the stuff. So we're going to start with what to collect. And this, I'm just going to go real quick because I already explained a little bit of the challenges. But I think that one important thing that I have um, actually to share with you with a couple companies that I've been to is that the question is, what do I need to prioritize, right? I have all this stuff right here in my environment, and a lot of them are already moving to following some type of like attack, right, framework, right? MITRE attack framework. Uh, everybody familiar with the MITRE attack framework in here? Uh, right, it, it, it's, it's funny, it's, it, it, it's like, you know, all over the place, and everybody's using it for different type of scenarios, red team, blue team, incident response, anything, right? So. The big thing about um, using the MITRE attack is that you can actually start, for example, taking a look into every single technique that different teams are actually associating to. For example, in a red team report, they say you might need to actually have accessibility features turned on or, or you know, some type of logging actually to gather that data. Blue team could say, you know what, um, after our research, we believe that we cannot even catch that stuff. So you have different teams talking about the same type of framework, and one good thing to do is to look into the data sources part of every technique of MITRE. And as you can see here, we have, uh, you know, we need like file monitoring, process monitoring, or Windows registry keys and stuff like that. But when you go to a, for example, access token manipulation, you're still actually now getting API monitoring, for example, access tokens, and this is where the conversation about host-based detection techniques comes into place. Because now you know what you need per data source. For example, for API monitoring, I don't think that that's actually uh, you know, native on the box, and actually people are using scripts in order to get that data. And if you want something like process monitoring or registry, you might need probably Sysmon um, and things like that. So that's really important to, to start understanding how to collect all the data. And at the end, for example, something that I did for an organization to was to start telling them exactly where they are from a coverage perspective, um, and focusing on specific tactics of the, of the whole minor attack framework. And here you can see that when we talk about an EDR solution, and just you know, keep that in mind, from a coverage perspective, it looks great. Right, they tell you that they can pretty much touch every single tactic, and they can actually give you most of the data that you need per technique, which at the end transform into like per tactic. I'm helping you 89 percent for persistence, for example. But the reason why I say keep that in mind is that this is just from a data coverage perspective. If you go to the link at the bottom, um, that one pretty much is going to show you how you can explain a little bit of beyond just the coverage where you start talking about data quality and things like that. And, yep, quite up. Cool, so yeah, uh, I think everybody probably understands the necessity to collect endpoint. Um, but I think so many people focus on kind of building a castle around their network, right? 
uh, which works for the most part, but you know, then once somebody gets through, you know, they basically have free reign to move around, right? So a lot of adversaries, a lot of commodity malware, you know, is basically using simple techniques, living off the land, things that Roberto talked about, right? And not only can you just not build a castle around a network, you know, at this point, you know, pretty much everybody has a laptop. They're accessing data in, in various ways. Leaving the network, when they leave the network, you know, they get hit um, like by uh, evil maid or connected to some unsecured Wi-Fi, right? Then, you know, they have a foothold on that computer and then from there, you know, your, your billion dollars and all the different network security products are essentially worthless, right? Yeah, you know, you could catch them on the outbound, but, you know, good luck if they're using Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or some other legitimate site as a C2, but, so, going into WEF, uh, I think I heard Dave Kennedy talk about, you know, WEF and Windows logs a little bit this morning, but, uh, you know, kind of thinking of, you know, there's, there's ways to collect endpoint logs other than WEF. The, the problem is, there's a few problems, uh, is most of them require third-party software, so, just talking to Roberto last night and heard that, you know, somebody was installing a piece of software on all 400,000 computers, right? So, you know, how not only are increasing the attack surface, whatever vulnerabilities are in that piece of software, you now have to update those 400 pieces of software. You have to open up firewall rules from everywhere, you know, for those logs to get from your endpoint host back to, you know, whatever your collection mechanism is. So, with WEF, Right, it uses built-in, your built-in credentials, right, using Kerberos, so that prevents things like man in the middle, you're not having to install like domain admin or some local administrative privileges on every single one of your boxes, right? Um, you know, because adversaries are, you know, will leverage your EDR solution to pivot or move around your network if, if they can. Um, the other thing about, about web is you can, with bandwidth issues, right, collecting from ATMs or you know something has a one megabyte upload uh, link is that you can throttle it in all sorts of different ways. You can rate limit it. Um, you can you can basically filter down to like I only want this event if it equals that, right? Like so you could just collect one event from one host, right? And with group policy, you can set you know things based on what site it's at, what subnet it has, all sorts of different variables. Like you know uh, for DNS debug logs. Uh, we only run it if there's a registry key that it is a DNS server, right? So, um, and these are things that like Windows themselves use. Matt Swan, I know they use uh, WEF for ETW, right? 300,000 servers, you know? So this isn't something that should impact your network, right? And that's 300,000 servers in production for, you know, Fortune 500 companies that use their product, those servers for email. Cost is free, right? You're basically just paying for hard drive storage. Um, and, you know, a uh, Jessica Payne basically did a live demo on how to set up WEF and uh, jumping back up to the top, like the most important things about logs, like if you want anything done in security, uh, you're going to have to get buy-in from the other company or other departments in your company. Security doesn't necessarily make any money, right? Like you save a company from losing money, but some companies like really don't have any intellectual property, they just need uptime. So if you want things done, you have to, you have to get buy-in, right? Like, in, you know, we went to a uh, place over in Europe, deployed WEF in, you know, 20, 30 minutes, whatever, and just started, you know, helping out the help desk people with printer issues, right? So, you know, you know, make yourself, uh, make yourself valuable. So, uh, this is basically an over, overview of, of uh, the commands and the GPOs that it takes to deploy WEF, like I said, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, I'm not going to go through each one, but... The blog for Jessica Payne's uh, talk at Microsoft Ignite is down at the bottom. <clears throat> so, back to Roberto. Yeah. So, you know, now that we saw the you know, collection into like why you need to prioritize and how to collect it, you know, in a more affordable way, uh, now we talk about the transformation uh, piece in here. And one of the big issues that we're trying to solve, and it's something that we're going to be sharing soon now in probably you know, future blog posts and things like that. It's actually how to come up with a global schema into all the different logs that you have. Um, I've, uh, I've had a couple conversations with different people using different technologies, and I actually asked two pieces of log, uh, well, sorry, two event logs uh, to like six different companies, and they parse it in a different way. So when you even like move to one company to another one, for example, you will see different things being defined a different way and things like that. And 
And once again, uh, you know, once you start relying on like, automatic confirmation of the data, it's when you start actually getting issues where you start naming things that are not the same um, in different event logs. Uh, for example, just a, you know, just a quick one, you know, 4624 and 4648, right? 4624 is just authentication logs, for those who don't know, but that one has two different usernames. And the first username is actually the one that reports the 4624 log, and the other new account being uh, used for authentication is the account that is performing the action to authenticate to the box, okay? So in that log, um, we can call the user um, performing the action, the username. But when it goes to a different log, like 4648, which is for explicit credentials, you still have two usernames, but the first one is the one that actually is performing the action, and it's actually, let's say, impersonating a different user, or starting a new process with a different user. Some people call the first one, the one performing the action, the source username, and they're calling the second one the username. So when you have two logs, the definition of username are different, right? But those two values are in the same field. So when you as an analyst, you go and try to look for a username, you start getting information that it's not what you need in the middle of an investigation, right? So this, that's exactly what is going on, and, and you know, hopefully today you can actually see a couple of examples. Um, and global schema is actually what we're going to try to you know, push us to today. So this is this is basically my life, right? So who in here parses logs? Yeah. How do you feel after you parse logs all day? Yeah, pretty much, right? Feel sad, maybe maybe dirty and worthless, those sort of things. So um, yeah. So gonna get into you know why we have to parse logs. So I'm uh, gonna talk a little bit about uh, different issues that you know uh, Roberto mentioned in terms of. Uh, different variations, field names, those sort of things. I'm not going to spend a, hopefully a lot of time on this so we can actually get into the solution and make some people smile instead of dealing with this stuff. So yeah, logs are absolutely the worst. They're just endless variations of all sorts of different different things. And not only that, right, so there's possible ways to break your parsers. I don't know exactly if these work, right, but you know, if you want to break SEP, just throw in some pipes, JSON, throw in some curly braces, XML, just throw in some uh, greater than equal signs, right, as uh, an adversary, you know, just add it in the command line, add it in the scheduled task. Um, you know, a lot of people will just drop logs that are parsed incorrectly, which is, you know, the, ro the wrong thing to do from A, if your parser is wrong, right, and B, just from a malicious standpoint, uh, somebody is just breaking your parsers and then, you know, the logs go nowhere. Uh, you also have the challenge of, okay, now, you know, how do I differentiate between a, you know, say, bro log and a Windows log and a DNS Windows log and a uh, Palo Alto firewall log and a Cisco ASA firewall log? Well, now I have to open up a port for each, right? And then, you know, it per puts a burden back on network admins and, you know, now your security people are trying to, you know, get help from other departments and you just ask them from something else again and you give them nothing, right? Um, so, the other thing is just values. So which one is it? Is it allow or is it permit? Who knows, right? Uh, tipping point, SMB is not a protocol last time I checked. Uh, I think that's just TCP, UDP, ICMP, and some uh, VPN things, and a few others, right? Uh, SSS, SSL TLS naming, uh, is it a space, is it a dot? Who knows, right? But why should you not be able to go from a bro SSL log to a Suricata or some other device's SSL log? Casing, and then again, network devices are some of the worst. Uh, there's a VLAN down in the bottom, right? 1999 is a VLAN, so you know, just don't throw an interface right into your logs. Uh, PowerShell, uh, this is a fun one. Uh, this is in help, parser I wrote. Uh, so let's see here. This is everything I'm showing you right now is not parsed by WinLog beats or NX log or you know some some other thing that you're going to collect using uh, endpoint logs. So you have this needs parsed, these need parsed, and everything else needs parsed. Awesome. Uh, 4104, another another monster, right? Can be up to 32,000 bytes or characters. Uh, got you got to grab this. Everything below that is part of the script block text, and then you got stuff down here. And there's usually even more file name and a few other things. 
Scheduled task, uh, again, not parsed anywhere. Uh, what We put it in help, right? It, it's coming. Like, yeah, anywhere okay. Anywhere. Tonight, tomorrow, whatever. Uh, but, yeah, this all needs parsed. Uh, great, you create a scheduled task. Okay, now you have a name. But what is the actual command being ran? Um, this is some of it, and there's more. So, okay, yeah. Using help already. Sorry. Oh, it is. It's yeah. So, okay, so the power show stuff and scheduled task stuff is in, is in help now. So. Uh, me and Roberto work in, you know, in our spare time, right? This week, another one, NetFlow bytes. Like, uh, who here has considered using like a firewall as NetFlow? Anybody? Yeah, well, you guys are doing it right. So, why not? Like, uh, you know, Palo Alto has it. It has, you know, network application layer detection. It's actually pretty good NetFlow usage, right? So, uh, and again, why can't you sum all these together? Field names, is it a URL or a URI? Who knows? And then IPs are just the absolute worst. I'm not even going to get into usernames and host names because there'll be six slides, right? So uh, some of these are from Pro, some of these are from Sericata, but you know, I'll just show you one more with, uh, with Windows. So I found over 18 different IP address fields that are names, right? Just in Windows logs. And um, you know, not only is it just 18 different fields, but you see it's a mix of IPv6. Sometimes it will have, you know, uh, file, it's a file share, so it's double slash in the beginning. Who knows what that second one is under a set update server? I'll, I have no idea. So, um, you know, have fun with that stuff, but, you know, uh, we'll be in healthcare soon. So, uh, more challenges, you know, IDS alerts are always backwards. Uh, desk port, your server's probably not listening on 1024, but that's what the desk port looks like. Uh, proxies, and then, Microsoft names a field Prodes, uh, submitted uh, TechNet, they yeah, haven't heard anything back, but that will be renamed and help, so. Uh, so what now? You know, I've got all these these issues. Thanks, Nate, you know, I'm already sad enough as it is working in InfoSec, and you know, the job is challenging enough, so. Um, you know, let's talk about some pre-writes. So your database should only be limited by your creativity, right? So. Shouldn't be limited based on field length, uh, storage, capacity, EPS, log formatting, uh, market focus. Uh, database needs to be flexible, right? You need to be able to solve any problem that somebody throws at you in terms of, you know, uh, different formats, Ceph, JSON, XML. I mean, you know, even being able to just ingest like an HTTP web request from some little server or some little device. Um, you know, it has to have the ability to be open source, you know. Um, other, there's tons of smart people out there, smarter than me, you know, uh, that are solving problems. And, you know, you can just take that, the stuff that they've already done and just put it right in your product. So, and then the most important, one of the most important things is the data table, right? So it's just essentially, what does the vendor call the original name? And then what do you call it, right? So you're giving an analyst access to a database and you have 800 fields and you know they have no idea what they're looking at, right? But it's just a simple Excel spreadsheet, right? Like column one is your field name, column two is what the vendor called it, right? And you might have, is if it's an integer or flow or a short or whatever it is, right? Just a, just a cheat sheet, you know? Uh, so solution, so Talking about all those problems, the uh, reason we've used ELK inside of HELC is uh, it meets all those prerequisites and more. So uh, sure a lot of people have in here have heard of Elastic, ELK, and those sort of things, but for those who haven't, Elasticsearch is just the back-end database, right? Storing your logs. Logstash is doing all uh, the boring stuff, uh, you know, like the transformation, the normalization, quote-unquote enrichment, right? Um, and Kibana is the web interface just to view those logs from the back end. And one of the other reasons that we chose Logstash is it has the ability, or Elk is it has the ability, Logstash has the ability to drop into basically raw Ruby code, right? So if there's not a problem that you can solve in their, you know, 40, 50 plugins that they have, uh, you know, just go get on Stack Overflow and, you know, how to do something in Ruby, right? That's how we all program anyways. And then, uh, yeah, they have XPAC, they have license support, so, you know, if it's uh, Elastic, it's open source, can you know, it's not supported, that's, you know, not true, so. Um, this is essentially just a small overview, Logstash transforming, Elastic Search is then storing those documents, and Kibana is visualizing it, you know, querying it. Uh, so, 
Yeah, so how do you solve all these problems without slowing down your pipeline? Uh, just remember that like in assembly, in computer code, like a compare statement is literally a few bytes and it adds like no overhead to CPU. Like uh, CPU should be able to perform millions of those things a second or, uh, or more, who knows. Uh, you have a long queue like Kafka or Redis, some other database in front that you're taking the pressure of something like Logstash or your Elasticsearch or any other database you have Take the pressure of like having to uh, ingest ingest those events uh, at this and at the same time transforming all of them, uh, and then caching some of the slowest things: is GeoIP lookups uh, and AS, AS lookups. So caching will help that. Uh, if you don't believe me, um, this is basically just a picture of one of my environments. About 10,000 EPS. This is without a message queue in front. Uh, but you can see in the bottom left, maybe, maybe not, but the event latency is under 4 milliseconds, and that's with over 4,000 lines of log stash code. So, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you, give you a few examples on, uh, you know, how to not make it slow, I guess. Put it simply, we don't have time. No, we so, uh, perform the least expensive. So, if anybody's written IDS signatures, right, like uh, for Suricata or, or snort you know uh before you perform like some crazy regex you want to say like for an http say like is http and request method git or something else right and then perform that um so it kind of works the same way in log stash so cisco asa what like 20 30 000 log messages or something right so just don't like blindly fire regexes at all of them so i do like a really small uh pre-parsing and this stuff will all be in help uh, eventually. Some of the networking stuff right now is just mostly endpoint. Um, but doing like a, a basic Cisco ASA parsing in the beginning, so I can just literally do a compare for all these different ones before I just before I jump into firing a hundred different regexes at Cisco ASA logs. Um, another example is, you know, if you're going to do geo enrichment, uh, BGP AS name or uh, just geo city location, the fancy stuff for graphs or uh, for visualizations is, you know, don't just again throw loopback IPs to do a lookup for geo or RC 1918. Um, this will eventually get faster once I just make it a Ruby code to do starts with, but uh, it's just a regex that's saying, you know, like starts with 10 dot, 10 dot like that's all 10.0 slash 8, right? So, um, and then, you know, do a compare at the end uh, before you do those expensive lookups. Uh, so the disparate data sets, so these, you know, Windows has IPs, Bro has IPs, Suricata has IPs, right? So assuming that you've named those fields one name, right? You then can start creating IP pairs uh, to solve that IDS uh, problem where things are backwards or you know you just want to go from a Windows connection to a Bro connection. So fingerprinting both of these kind of creates a hash when you concatenate them. Um, and then, you know, uh, who knows what I was doing here, but it works. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I ran into all sorts of issues before I could actually get this done. But uh, so this basically creates a swaps it. Yeah, so it basically swaps it. Uh, oh, this is definitely hot, but okay. <laughs> Uh, so it basically swaps it so if, if it's if the IP was source or if the IP was desk, but just between those two pairs. And again, this code will be in help once we start getting network stuff. Um, and then another thing, so so we have about like seven or eight different IP fields uh, that aren't source IP, desk IP, you know, source NAT, desk NAT, those sort of things. Uh, Cisco ASA sometimes can have five different IP fields in one. Uh, log, right? So, how do you solve that problem being able to search all IP addresses across all logs? Uh, well, it's one line in the elastic search mapping, right? So, I'm going to show basically what you can do with that afterwards. Uh, so, right here, we have a Windows log, have an IP address. Click this, it's a URL template, right? Um, and I'm in basically Discover tab, just a raw log right now, boring stuff. So. You click that, that's a URL. Basically take you to just an overview. You can see at the top, basically I have a field, you know, meta any IP, right? And that's gonna search uh, the source IP, desk IP, source NAT, log IP, 
um, a few other NAT fields, and then Cisco VPN session IP, and a few other things, right? Uh, wasn't really able to get any dashboards, but you know, you can start with this. You know, we're able to see like processes spawn on that IP, all the DNS requests that that IP has done. You get bro logs, all the HTTP requests that thing is made, right? You just do a small overview dashboard. So when somebody's analyzing, they can get a very quick picture of what that host is doing. So another one we've done is any user, right? So whether it's a guest user, source user, uh, who knows what else eventually when we finish it all. So click it and it takes you to an overview, what that user has done, uh, all the PowerShell they've created, processes they've created, 4624 events, things that they've walked into. Uh, and then back to Roberto. Yep. So one of the things that I wanted to show you just before we start getting to that is that you, know, you see all this stuff, like all this parsing going on, things like that. Now the idea is not just to push, let's say, you know, use Logstash or you know, try to be a ninja in Logstash and you learn all this stuff. The idea is to, you know, go back to your organization or just whatever you're using and you start kind of thinking about those things. Is that how can I put every single IP field that I have, no matter what is called into one, and I can start doing you know, these type of aggregations and you know, kind of like normalization of the data. And I think that that's, you know, powerful. I haven't seen too many uh, companies actually giving this power to their analysts, and I think that this is so powerful. I mean, like, I used to be a stock analyst as well, and it was hard to go through every single possibility of my username, computer, IP, and things like that. So that's the idea, just in case, right? And you can go back to the slides and probably show a little bit of, like, what the mapping looks like uh, for Elasticsearch and what we can actually transform into whatever technology you're using. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, help was basically built. I mean, yeah, I worked as a stock analyst, still do analysis work. Same with Roberto, so it's you know it's a database sim, whatever, uh, for analysts by analysts, right? Yeah. So. so, one thing that actually I, I remember uh, when the organization that I worked before, like, no, actually before the bank too, um, it was actually a little bit of the idea of like getting you know hashes and things like that. And the moment everybody just enable everything, then you have one field called hashes, and you have all the single hashes that you can get from system, for example. So that's you know when you want to do some stacking techniques and trying to get like what is a you know most unique uh, hash and things like that you won't be able to do it just because the hash has everything in one field <coughs> basic basic plugin I think we actually talked about it yesterday uh, you know we made kind of like double checking like how easy this would be uh, but I haven't seen actually anybody use sharing this uh, you know combination of fields which is so easy basically takes the hashes splits it by the uh, column first so we have um, a hash, let's say, uh, 75, comma, chat 56, comma, things like that. So we split it by the comma first, and then our values are going to be split now by a equal sign, because we have MD5 equals its value. That's it. And at the end, you will have you know, something similar. Once again, like in your own technology, I expect as an analyst to have the capability to look into every single hash that way. But one thing is that, um, it comes down to like um, a game where we talked at the beginning where it's about transforming the data but at the same time not just allowing automatic things happen and apply a little bit of your expertise. One thing that we were actually looking into is creating a dashboard that says show me all the uh, hashes, uh, you know, unique hashes for a computer and also for a process name. Does anybody see what the problem here is? If I have the hashes with unique codes and unique processes? Anybody? Yeah. All right. Pretty much we're saying that we have four processes, right, for all different processes with the same hash. So that doesn't make sense, right? And the thing was that pretty much when you start working with Windows Events uh, 7 and 10 with Sysmon, the hash on Windows Event uh, 1 is actually um, in relation to the process, to the image that executed, the image that was created. And with Event ID 7 is basically the image loaded a process loading an image, so the hash pretty much applies in Windows 7 to the image loaded and image 1 to the process itself. That's what you hear makes sense. I do have kernel 32WLL, same hash, right? But I have a different process. And this right here is on event that you said. So I'm just going to throw that out there because I've seen people building uh, you know, dashboards and they don't understand exactly what is going on. So you might have some false no false positive, but you will have a lot of like um, people don't understand it exactly what they're looking at, and they might probably freak out if they see one process. I'm sorry, uh, 
one hash with four or five different process, right? So you might think that somebody, you know, someone is impersonating a process, things like that. All right, so then at the end, uh, something that is still a work in progress, actually. Um, it's, it's, it's just a help for those that haven't seen it yet. But it's just basically grabbing all these things that we talked today. Um, and as you can see, we have Lovesatch, Elasticsearch, and Kibana, which is the core of all this. But something that I was, uh, you know, working on, and you know, thank God I have also Nate in Twitter and Slack, we can just, you know, change, um, change ideas. But it was, it was pretty much now take this build to the next level. I've heard a lot of machine learning, AI, you know, all these advanced analytics stuff. It's awesome. I mean, I've seen a lot of companies do it the right way. But if you don't know how to, you know, everybody shows you this part, but they don't show you what you have to do in order to get there, right? So this build kind of like. That was the reason why I started doing this, kind of like a free build, was to start understanding what I need to do first in order to start getting into the cool stuff. So just real quick, um, ES Hadoop is basically just a library. It's a package that allows you to communicate your Elasticsearch with um, Hadoop jobs. But the Hadoop jobs actually can be done standalone by other technologies such as Spark. So I don't need Hadoop actually uh, servers in there in order to be communicating with my Elasticsearch. So Spark is basically, in plain uh, words, allows you to do parallel computing, so you can execute things at the same time in parallel, and then um, pretty much uh, distribute your resources, clusters, all these, um, I would say, operations that you're doing on your Elasticsearch. So you can pull data from Elasticsearch, and then start using libraries such as machine learning and things like that from Spark. And then at the end, you can actually use something called graph frames, which uh, depends on data frames. And for those that are not familiar with data frames, it, it just think about an Excel sheet, columns and rows. It's a tabular format, how you present the data. The graph frame takes two data frames. I'm going to show you in a little bit. We still have five minutes. Um, I'm going to show you how you can put two data frames and pretty much start doing graph queries. Similar uh, concepts such as Neo4j. And I don't need a Neo4j database here. Right? And then Jupyter Lab is something that just got actually released to be used by you know anybody now, uh, more robust actually than last year. It's also in this build, and uh, it's already actually in GitHub. And this is the part that we talked today, which is a transformation of the data. Uh, so the help uses actually a Kafka before Lostash, and that's just for you know scalability purposes. And it's basically a published Publish, subscribe um, you know, technology. So basically, all your data goes to Kafka, and then Logstash, you know, subscribe to specific, um, you know, they call them topics, um, to pull the data and then you know throw into Elasticsearch. And as you can see here, and probably you can look into the slides later a little bit in detail, but Logstash works with input filter, with filters, right? and then with output you know, filters. Right? And then you know, here's where you can start transforming your data with different filters per data source that you have. I do have an enrichment also uh, from OTX, which is a threat intelligence platform. And the only reason why I now have that is because now I can actually pay, um, um, start looking into my hashes, for example, and also you know, the IP addresses. If you don't have that you know, Normalization of your data, you won't be able to apply all this intelligence to one field. You'll be able to start, you know, hitting every single field and kind of turn to a mess. And then output, of course, you know, we divide. Actually, Nate's idea was to divide it um, in, in, you know, different indexes or sorry, indices, different indices. But at the same time, to keep a naming convention that if I just say logs hyphen uh, star, I will hit all my, you know, indices at one. I've seen a lot of organizations naming their indices. Let's say technology one, um, you know, uh, case two, you know, different names that the, you know you won't be able to actually put them together just in one query. So that was something that we were trying also to address with Logstash and you know show you how you can start creating your own indices also. So and that, and that also helps on Elasticsearch uh, backend in, in six six dot x or the version six. Uh, separating things in different indices actually allows like greater score, greater compression, um, those sort of things. So yep. that stuff's huge, but it's just a small thing. And global schema, actually, those are the other ones because I don't want to say that we are right. Right, there is other schemas that are actually being used by, for example, Splunk, uh, Splunk actually common information model. It has their own schema to name the field names in a certain way and things like that. I particularly might disagree with a couple things, but it, you know. 
it makes sense from a data perspective, the way how they do it, but there are certain things that I would like to do it differently. That's what I like to have a dynamic, uh, you know, technology that I can just, you know, change my parts and things like that. I started my own, right, just to share with, you know, with anybody. Uh, it's actually called Ozen. Uh, it's open source security events metadata. Um, and it's just kind of sharing a little bit how I name my fields and things like that. And once again, I, I'm not 100% right, right, we're not right, but at least uh, it's going to allow you to start thinking a little bit that there is some documentation that needs to happen every single time you create a field or want to parse a field in your database. And at the end, I already showed you this, but something I wanted to show you before really is uh, help is still in development, so I'm actually going to be releasing it probably in May, like the version that is going to have a lot of different examples. The one thing that uh, people ask me is, how can you use graphs? You know, like everybody wants to do Neo4j and things like that. Awesome, good stuff, but I like to do it, I would say, in a more affordable way. And, you know, graph frames free, right? The way how it works is you have two data frames. One of them is going to show you the relationship, source to destination, right? Who is actually related to who. And the other one is pretty much, you know, your vertices, where it's going to be your nodes. So pretty much here I can have, you know, Roberto, Nate, and other people. And the attribute is going to be probably my age, you know, city where I was, uh, you know, born, things like that. And at the end, the idea is to start applying these into our data. For example, like Sysmo logs, right? Where I, you know, Sysmo has a parent process and it has a child process, right? So with that relationship, I can easily say, why don't you show me process that is part of process and the same process is part of another process? My nodes are my processes, right? Process, process, process. That's my count. It's called my vertex. And my edge or my edges is pretty much the relationship from node to node, spawn. Right? Simple stuff. So then I just want to do an example real quick. I say, you know what, let me open PowerShell, uh, start you know, command.exe, and then command.exe is start PowerShell.exe. So that would look like something like that. Right? That's familiar with a lot of stuff that you do. For example, even when you, uh, you know, start Empire or even like, you know, command remote where you're going to see these kind of like relationships happening all the time. Um, and one thing that this is actually allowed me to do is that if I go to my Elasticsearch or you know, any other technology, if, I, if they don't have a graph capability, you will have to do a lot of like or statements. Kind of say, hey, you know, show me command it, see your PowerShell, and then you can see in here, for example, that Explorer has a parent GUI. It's a long one, but you can you know, look at it later, but basically goes Explorer to PowerShell, PowerShell command it, see, command it, see to PowerShell. Right? But at the same time, I'm going to be actually grabbing other processes that are actually executing command that exceed in PowerShell. It's not efficient. So with graph frames, you can actually use kind of like a similar concept, right, as Neo4j. It has like the cipher, I would say, uh, uh, concept also, where you have, without any, um, I would say, um, names like, oh, you know, show me command that exceed or show me PowerShell. No, we're talking about here patterns. Show me anything that did from A to B and from B to C based on my relationships. And then I can easily just identify my Explorer, PowerShell, PowerShell, command C, command C to PowerShell. Now, this was thrown against, uh, I think it was like 500 events. And pretty much I've got three rows, right? So I can just probably go into the other ones and see what's going on. But the idea here is that I didn't call for PowerShell. I didn't specify command exe. I didn't specify anything. All I specified was a pattern. So that's the idea of graphing, is to start finding those patterns and start putting notes together. And I think that I would love to have this instead of a signature that says, oh, if Excel, if Excel executes PowerShell and then command exe, trigger, right? This is going to trigger every single possibility of a relationship of three processes, for example. Simple stuff, and just time, I think two minutes. But uh, if you need uh, anything also, I think Nate, you want to say anything else about here, but it's just that you can contact me or Nate, and the repo is over there. And it's going to be a lot of stuff that I'll be developing with the help soon, that I'll be showing more examples way beyond just this. But at least from a basic perspective, I think that we're accomplishing something um, that a lot of uh, other tools are not doing yet for free. Yeah. 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 Help repo. I mean, uh, you know, get on there, install, use a Docker, other few simple things based on uh, Ubuntu, so we didn't have to kill ourselves with SE Linux or something else, right? Uh, and you know, feel free to open up issues. Right. The more people using it, the better it's going to get. The easier it's going to be. Uh, yeah. I mean, 
we love questions, those sort of things. You know, feel free to hit us up or whatever. So, we've got like ten minutes uh, for questions if anybody has any. So, you have any questions? Uh, yes. Are your slides going to be available? Oh yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, right there, it's case, yeah, case sensitive. So the Bitly link at the bottom, uh, but yep. So and these, then they're identical slides, right? So yep. just going to take you to Google Docs. Uh, if you want to use a URL shortener if you don't trust me, go ahead. <laughs> and once again, like if you have any questions, also like after this presentation or anything like that, you know, feel free to reach out to me or Nate. I mean, like we love to you know collaborate and you know talk to anybody that has probably better ideas. I mean, you know, this is just an approach to something that I'm not seeing out there. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that, that, that of course, is, you know, is expensive, right? But if you can actually show a little bit of a, a you know, prototype of where you want to be, you might probably task also your vendors to get to where you want to be, right? So that's the idea, and that's the reason why I started working on the help, is to start showing other organizations that you can do it. And, yeah. and it's, it's just a matter of putting the right people together, and all the right ideas together to make it happen. Yeah, and I mean, the goal, the goal of the help is to basically empower anybody to use a sim, right? And, you know, however many years of experience Roberto has and I have, and some of the stuff Brian and I work on, and all sorts of other people, right? Like, uh, and basically make it so you're not having to buy uh, appliances and products and those sort of things, right? Like. You can then just start spending your money on training and consulting and freaking empowering your own people, right? So, uh, yeah. All right. Yep. No questions? No, no question. Okay. Are you doing any pre-processing uh, before you're sending it with the next log or whatever forwarder you're using? Are you pretty much sending everything in like JSON and then doing the processing afterwards? Yeah, so, uh, so right right now, like with help, we haven't really gotten to like, you know, here's the GPO, you just import or whatever, right? That stuff's coming. Uh, you're talking about like filtering. Yeah, filtering yeah. Data. Yeah, uh, no, uh, again, like one of the major environments I collect from, you know, uh, storage, like we have just a ton of storage, so no. Uh, but we have written, I've written a blog on like using uh, NXLog web and Elastic as like canary file, right? Um, and then you can basically create, I showed an example of creating that subscription just to only collect if that canary file was open, right? So like I said, that's, yeah. Um, and that, that uh, bit.ly link for my Windows log zero to hero talk, uh, is just basically a fire hose of everything you would need for Windows, right? Um, Sorry, but yeah, uh, not yet, but yes, yeah, at the bottom, so, yeah. But yeah, no, again, like I said, if, uh, you know, bandwidth and those things are an issue, you definitely yeah. should. So for example, the XML is pretty easy to write. For example, so, uh, something that, you know, that I was doing, uh, that I was testing with other people that I was working with, uh, let me show you a little bit of that help real quick. Uh, so it's just having, you know, Kafka front, where actually a lot of things can happen, even in um, you know, even a Kafka. For example, here you have Kafka going to Logstash, and uh, it's a, all the processing happens in Logstash. But you can actually have some point, which is going to show soon, is start talking straight to uh, to Kafka and doing real time actually automation as well. So you can have queries being sent straight to Kafka. Logstash still fits your Elasticsearch with all the data that it needs, pre-processed, blah, blah blah. But then Spark allows you to kind of like get where I was showing you here. Like, I would love Kafka to show me this, um, you know, right away and say, Kafka, send this, well, I'm sorry, Spark, talk to Kafka, do this, show me this uh, table and put it to an index that says, you know, analyze data. And I want this to be a dashboard, for example. So we have like two pipes, one that goes everything and the other one that goes, you know, analyze data in real time instead of having a Spark analyst doing all these queries for me. Yeah. And then another thing with uh, like events, so we have, uh, basically, we use uh, for the ID or you know the unique ID for the document within Elasticsearch. We use what is it MM3R or something, some whatever hash hashing, right? So uh, you get like even if the same event got duplicated twice, right? It's only going to store one. So that's really useful for like web load balancing or whatever because you can't really load balance web unless you use something like uh, Windows, you know, Windows clustering. 
doesn't occur in Rose Hall Authentication. You might know, might not for those who don't. That's why I'm saying it. Uh, so, you know, sometimes four or five of the same events will will get put into your database if you don't have that. But we have that in the pipeline, you know, so you can't have low balancing and those sort of things. So there's a lot you can do and eventually we'll probably probably start hashing Windows event logs minus, uh, you know, the timestamp, uh, the PID, and a few other things that are literally always going to change, right? And then you can just stack count, like I've seen this freaking event 400 million times over the last seven days, like, and then just kill it on the log stash side, right? Just drop if hash equal whatever. So, yeah, there's a lot you can do. And that's nice considering how fun it is. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I think in the I think in the talk, uh, in my Windows talk, like I showed, uh, one of the event IDs that Microsoft even recommended, like filtering if the example is right. So I think it took it down from like three million to like twenty, just by like filtering out the one thing, right? So and yeah, you could do that on the you know website or uh, you know pipe log line. stash, yeah, the pipe your data pipeline, those sort of things. But yeah, uh, it. WEF, WEF is fun, but you know, hopefully you just only have to pay 80, 90 bucks for hard drives or something. So, yeah. It's good, real good question. Yeah. Thanks. Good. Well, so, I, oh, yeah, so I guess why use WEF over like WinLog Beats or something that's kind of native oh, to the Elastic yeah. Suite? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So, yeah, so sorry, I forgot to mention that. Uh, I should have a freaking diagram one day. But, anyways, uh, let's say. You have all your WEF uh, devices going to one server, right? One Windows server, and then on there you do install WinLog Beats or NXLog. Yeah. So I forgot. I kind of forgot to mention that. So it's basically just only having to install that software on 10, 10 devices versus four hundred thousand or something like that. And really, you see that benefit on the end when it's one of the newer else. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, you don't have to update software, and you know, like. If it's in a Windows AD environment, it's going to get the GPO, right? right. right. If it's connected, it's authenticating, it's going to get a GPO. Right? For example, so like, you know, being example. able to push out just a GPO versus software and all this other stuff. I know, that, sorry, well, I know some, some uh, Sims and whatnot literally put like DA domain admin creds on every single box. And you're just like, all right, let's go. You know? So, something that actually I experienced with having WinLog beat across, let's say, all my endpoints, right? It's the amount of CPU that it takes as oh, well. Right, right. Right. So that's yeah. also something that you gotta test, right? But every time, for example, WinLog beat says, "Hey, I'm," it's funny. So I want to talk to Kafka, and then Kafka is not available. The CPU goes up because this kind of gets you, yeah. you know freaks out and says, "Man, I need to talk to Kafka." And it just like starts doing all this help and help, right? Yeah. So it just starts talking, trying to talk. Yeah. That is gonna kill your CPU as well. So also from a performance perspective, I think that it's better to use native stuff from the computer, send it to web, and you can see in there, then you can implement something like a windlock feed or NX log. So it's not gonna affect your environment as a whole. That's the same thing for those, for example, that are in the middle of like even like uh, you know, purchasing like an EDR or anything, any endpoint on your environment, there's a lot of testing that should happen. Right, so that's the same thing that when I did with Windows feed into my environment, it just it just killed my CPU. So I don't know what happened in there, but that's just something that actually I experienced uh, before. So. Yeah. And, I mean, and I mean, like like you asked, like it's uh, you know, WEF is like pretty much running in the background anyways, right? Like event logs are being written, so it's like you know, why not just take take that and you know, then you don't have to convince somebody to install third-party software on an ATM or something. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, like, one of the environments we went to uh, and deployed, or that I deployed WEF in, um, you know, they didn't have any server, quote unquote, right? They just had like 60. We're like, well, do you have anything with like 40 gigs uh, free hard drive space? So we just installed WEF on a print server, you know, call it a day. So, you know, you get it done on a, you put, make Windows 7 box a WEF server, you literally can make anything a WEF server or scale pretty well. Right, should easily be able to handle a few thousand, up to they say probably about ten thousand uh, hosts per web server. Right, so yeah, it's a good question. Good question. Do we have that's well, a minute. one minute? Okay, one minute for a question. Anybody else? Well, yeah. yeah, we're gonna be in a happy hour too. Like, if you think about anything else, just let me know. Just let they know. Anyway. Well, I might just be playing uh, Super Smash Bros. <laughs> yeah. <tomorrow. laughs> Yeah, it's, uh...
Yeah. Just interrupt me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, thank you guys. Yeah, thanks.